work to create a world that's free of infectious diseases. We work to make sure that no infectious disease is left unchallenged. We discover, develop, implement and evaluate health solutions. Working alongside the most at-risk communities. Doing so ultimately builds a healthier, safer world for everyone. We are the Kirby Institute. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Kirby Institute seminar series. Um, my name is Andrew Grulick. I uh, lead the HIV Epidemiology and Prevention Program here at, at the Kirby. And um, uh, I stepped in today at the last moment. We were going to have our director, Tony Kelleher, chairing today, but unfortunately he was unable to join us. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the various lands that we uh, are meeting uh, from today. And from where I am, uh, that is the medical people of the Eora Nation. And I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, them and their elders past, present and emerging. And of course, I extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who may be joining us today. Um, as usual, the, the seminar takes the form of a presentation and 10 minutes questions. However, today we have two speakers and we're going to be, I'm going to be introducing them uh, individually with the 30 minute presentation and the 10 minute um, question period after each talk. You can ask questions during uh, the presentation by using the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. And I, I would encourage you to ask those questions as they come to you uh, to ensure that we um, uh, can get your questions at the end. So to start with, I have um, really great pleasure in uh, introducing our first speaker, uh, Emeritus Professor Robin Wood, who's the head of Aerosol Research Centre at the Desmond Tutu Health Foundation. Uh, Robin is a registered infectious disease specialist physician with a wide international clinical experience. He's been involved with HIV and TB research over the last more than 25 years. He's authored and co-authored more than 500 peer-reviewed papers with approximately 30,000 citations being principal investigator of more than 50 clinical studies and has been a member of many scientific boards, including the International um, Partnership for Microbicides, the International TB Vaccine Initiative, and the US President's Emergency Program for AIDS Relief, which we of course all know as PEPFAR. Robin is talking today on uh, out of thin air, capture and visualization of tuberculosis aerosols. Robin, over to you. Good afternoon. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction. And I'd like to thank uh, the Kirby Institute for this opportunity to present to you. Um, my focus of research at the moment is on uh, tuberculosis, which is a major problem for South Africa, the country that I come from, and uh, particularly on the transmission of disease. So on, on the um, um, the life cycle of TB outside of the uh, uh, of, of the host. Now, this is the um, the unit um, we have, uh, and just to start with a little bit of uh, background on bioaerosol science, and uh, I think I'll go back uh, just over a hundred years now to um, um, this paper from Chausset in Paris. And he got tuberculotics to cough into um, a box structure in which he put uh, guinea pigs. And he noted that um, the air distribution within the box was quite important for the, um, uh, the risk of transmission disease. And he actually found 100 years ago from these smear positive individuals, he could uh, infect about 38% um, uh, of the guinea pigs. Well. Um, and that was a hundred years ago. Um, so if you look at the, the sort of experiment he was, uh, he was doing, uh, you can see in the blue, the cycle 
um, within the host and in the environment. He was he was sampling very early uh, in the um, survival life uh, in the environment of the uh, TB organism. Then if we go to the sort of 1950s, um, this classic work of uh, Wells and Riley, and uh, they again use guinea pigs as a measure of infectivity. And um, they, they basically took the air from a um, TB ward, passed it through the air conditioning system and then directed it towards guinea pigs. And they managed to show that about 13% of smear positive patients were infectious in this. But you remember that um, you have the dwell time of the particles that are produced by the individuals. Um, and then you've got the time through the air conditioning. So really, this is sampling the late survival of, um, um, of, of the TB infectious particles. And then um, we, we jump to uh, 20, um, 2012, and this is the work uh, of Fennelly, and um, what he did was had a cough box, and instead of having guinea pigs in it, he put uh, Anderson impactors in there, and he managed to find that about 28% of the TB cases um, were infectious, and he's measuring infectiousness by the ability to culture the organisms uh, on uh, solid media. Things really um, changed dramatically more recently, and this is the work from uh, uh, Caroline Williams. And uh, what they did is they used um, a standard mask and they inserted a gelatin uh, filter. And um, initially they used a bacteriophage assay and they managed to um, demonstrate that they could isolate this DNA um, from um, about 65% of patients. So again, you can see that this sampling is very early uh, in, the, um, in the exhalation of particles. They then subsequently uh, used the mask for longer periods of time. I won't go through the details of this slide, but they made comparisons with sputum. And I'll just highlight the, um, the factors just um, circle by the little red um, circle on the, um, the right-hand side. And you see they found that all the conventional um, associations with sputum positivity and, uh, and infectiousness uh, didn't have any statistical uh, significance for this. So um, the cough frequency, um, the sputum grade, uh, the chest radiograph seemed to be independent of um, what was happening in the bioaerosol. Then just a little bit of our early work, um, we used a slightly different approach. And um, this is a personalized clean room, essentially, in which we put individuals. And um, uh, we had um, uh, an initial protocol and then we changed the protocol. So what we used to do is put people into this um, box. Uh, we didn't ventilate it at all. We let them contaminate the box and then we sampled at about 55 liters per minute. Subsequently, we, um, we moved over to a, a cyclone system, which um, has a much higher flow rate. And you can see on the bar chart that um, we, um, we had many more TB organisms um, um, identified in this system. But you can see that here we've got the dwell time of the organisms in the um, in the box. Uh, so we're sort of sampling uh, aged particles, but not um, after a pr very prolonged period of time. And we found that we could actually identify RD9, which is an insertion uh, specific for MTB and culture, about 77% of um, uh, of smear positive patients. So if we just put that together to, to sort of quickly um, uh, recap, you can see that Chose had 38%. For the first 100 years, it seemed as though bioaerosols were a very insensitive um, measure of what was going on in the, uh, in the host. And you can see over the last 10 years that um, the efficiency of finding and detection of organisms has increased dramatically. And it's um, 
um, it's that that uh, I'm really going to focus on uh, in this talk. So this is a newer version of the um, of the respiratory aerosol sampling chamber, and um, this is what it looks like. Um, um, it's uh, collecting directly into um, a cone. Uh, we monitor CO2, so we can monitor the respiratory um, 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 maneuvers. We can measure the particles. Um, the circulation of air in the box is very, very um, uh, fast so that we can um, get the background noise down with um, filtration of a cubic meter per second. And uh, just on the right hand side, you see an ozone uh, sterilizing machine so that we can sterilize the, um, uh, the chamber uh, completely uh, between individuals. And this is the technique that we used. Uh, the problem that we realize is that focusing on a cough uh, was quite problematic because the velocity is so fast, it's 20, 40 meters per second. And air at those, uh, under those conditions is basically incompressible. So if you cough uh, into a cone, you feel the particles hit you in the, in the face as they bounce off. So what we did is we used computational fluid dynamic modeling to increase the flow rate so that we sucked out the particles so there was no rebound. And then we measure, measured the carbon, monox carbon dioxide, um, the aerodynamic particle size, and the cyclone for particle collections. And this is a sort of um, readout that we get. So if you look at the lower um, uh, graph in blue, you can see those are the carbon dioxide uh, changes uh, as each breath or cough takes place. And this, is, um, this was a series of coughs, 15 coughs, I think. Above that, you can see the different particle sizes. And you can see in the green, the large particles, which um, is on a log scale. So it's very small numbers of particles above uh, five microns in size. And you can see the other four graphs at the top. You can see the sequence um, uh, of increase particles with each of the respiratory maneuvers, as, as you see in the CO2. So that's the technique. Um, in our early work, we, uh, we were able to show what we thought was a TB organism on an electron microscope. So we think that for the first time we were able to visualize um, uh, TB organisms in the expired bioaerosol. And that um, uh, really focused us on the way we were going to move forward by trying to um, use microscopy as a sensitive measure. So just to just show you the measure we use, we use uh, something called a solvatochromic um, um, probe, which means that it uh, fluoresces particularly in um, lipid um, environments rather than aqueous. And uh, it's a trailose sugar um, linked to um, uh, a fluorophore. And you can see the trailose is taken into the uh, TB organism. It's modified by a so-called antigen 85 uh, complex. And then um, the uh, trailose uh, and the fluorescence is incorporated into the mycomembrane. This is the sort of thing that we can see. So you can see on the left-hand side some TB organisms, and you can see that the trailose is taken up particularly at the growing ends of the organism. And you can see on the right-hand side that we can measure the fluorescence along each um, organism length. We can measure the length and breadth and the shape of the organisms so that we can pick up the different phenotypes of TB that's coming out of individuals. Um, just technically, we, um, we collect in a liquid, we um, uh, spin down the liquid, and we put it over uh, these uh, nano well structures so that um, a nano well will have very little in the way of background um, uh, competing uh, fluorescence, um, um, and, the, and the wells with the organism will have a much better uh, signal to noise ratio. This was recently published by uh, 
uh, one of our PhD students. So we use the microscope to look at this, and this is just showing you some of the bioaerosols that we um, can identify. And you can see there's a lot of different phenotypes, um, long, short, fat, bright, less bright, angled, et cetera. So we're picking up a, um, a wide spectrum of, um, of uh, phenotypes um, in the bioaerosols. So this is just to show where we are now. With this technology, we can identify organisms in 90. Uh, three percent of smear positive individuals so we've increased the efficiency of, of collection and the sensitivity of detection and really what we're uh, what I'm going to talk about here is this is sort of a, a new field of uh, microbiology where we're looking at porcy bacillary samples and trying to get information out of those and um, this is because we've been able to now um, uh, detect uh, viable organisms because these organisms have to be able to incorporate the sugar and uh, just um, uh, try and see what we can use this for in order to answer some important TB questions. So um, we've looked at the prevalence of vi viable uh, organisms in sputum positive cases, just um, um, uh, stated that we have to 93%. Um, We've also looked at sputum negative cases, and interestingly, we get uh, very high numbers in, in that population as well. Uh, we've been looking at um, the monitoring of response to therapy, so we can um, identify these organisms throughout therapy, they decrease with therapy, but up to 30% of patients completing six months of therapy have very few scanty organisms at the end, and we don't know whether that uh, will be a predictor of uh, recurrence of disease, for instance. But um, uh, that's proof of concept has been completed. Uh, we're in the process of looking for asymptomatic individuals that are excreting these organisms or breathing them out in our very high burden populations um, in uh, Cape Town. And those studies are in progress. But the initial um, um, uh, results look as though we can uh, identify a significant number of people in the, individ in, in the communities that are excreting these organisms. And uh, the big challenge we've got, which is one of the challenges of porcy bacillary um, uh, science, rather than um, relying on hundreds of thousands of organisms in culture, is trying to get the whole genome sequencing uh, sequences out from these uh, sputum negative individuals. The challenge is really trying to optimize the collected biomass and also to try and um, use the, um, uh, the recent advances in sensitivity of detection of DNA by RNA baits, assays and those sort of things. But if we can get whole genome sequences out of people who are not sputum, sputum positive, then I think it will be an incredibly useful epidemiological tool. But what I'm going to talk about today is um, um, the importance of uh, cough uh, versus other respiratory activities for TB production. And this is, uh, again, the work of uh, one of our PhD students, and he's, uh, he's uh, managed to get the manuscript um, in press. So that's what I'm going to focus on uh, for the rest of the talk. And the reason for this is that I think, although um, TB is, um, is the organism we're using uh, to demonstrate this, that I think there are some other lessons for other um, uh, pathogens and uh, particularly airborne by small particles. And I think um, that makes it a little bit more ref um, relevant uh, outside of uh, high burden TB uh, environments. So if we look here at um, some of the pictures that have been um, published, this is um, Lydia Buria um, looking at these um, high speed uh, photographs of what comes out of people. They look pretty horrendous. Um, and it seems to me as though this is probably more typical of a sneeze rather than uh, a true cough, cough, but we'll see that as we go along. But the um, question really is where, where are these particles, um, infectious particles coming from? Are they coming from the large airways where there's high flows 
uh, in relatively large tubes? Um, are they coming from the upper airways, which is what would happen with uh, a sneeze, with uh, either the vocal cords vibrating or um, explosive um, um, uh, airflows through the nasal passages? Or are they coming from the peripheral lung? And uh, th this is um, um, a um, hypothesis that's been for put forward that in fact particles are produced during inspiration rather than expiration, that as the closed alveoli in the uh, peripheral lungs expand, um, so the surfactant, the detergent that they're covered in, produces little particles, and perhaps that's the um, source of the particles. So this was the experiment that uh, I want to discuss with you. Uh, we did three um, maneuvers. So you see on the left-hand side, somebody um, uh, with their head uh, uh, placed within this uh, cone and uh, the flow rate is around about 300 liters per minute in order to capture uh, each of the, um, of the respiratory maneuvers. So the first one is um, forced vital capacity as um, a, a deep breath in and a complete expiration. And uh, we got our uh, participants to do that uh, once every 20 seconds. So uh, about 15 um, uh, maneuvers within five minutes. And in the middle of those five minutes, we diverted uh, 100 liters uh, per minute of the flow into a um, aerodynamic particle counter. And you can see in B, that's where you get the sample particle counts. Um, individuals uh, were then did five minutes of just normal tidal breathing. And you can see that um, we sampled throughout that at 100 liters per minute. And then we have the coughs um, as the third maneuver. Each of those is collected into a different um, uh, liquid cyclone collection process and stained uh, with the number of organisms um, uh, counted. So this is uh, just looking at that. So uh, at the top of the screen, you'll see the bins into which we, uh, uh, we categorize the aerosol particles, um, uh, the small particles, uh, half a micron to one micron in the first collecting, the second one to 1 1.5, 1.5 to two. And then we quickly move up into uh, the bigger categories of um, two to five and five to 10. And you can see that if you look at the, the vital capacity, the tidal breathing and the cough, you see the, exactly the same pattern. Um, obviously the, the curves are determined by the size of the buckets that we've uh, categorized into them. But using uh, these, you can see that um, each of them produces particles um, of those sizes. And if you look at the proportions uh, uh, that are captured uh, by each of the maneuvers of each of the sizes, you can see that this up to um, the fourth category, that it's exactly the same pattern. It's only with the very large particles and they're, they're occurring uh, increasingly uh, uh, rarely that you can see this, um, uh, the looks as though it's different, but because the numbers are so small, it doesn't reach statistical uh, power. So if we now move on to the organisms rather than the, the, rather than the particles, you can see that um, at the top left-hand side, we're finding organisms in each of the three maneuvers. And you can see we're dealing with small numbers at the table next to it. You can see it's um, four to six, um, three to six uh, particles. And you can see the maximum some of our patients can give up to um, in, um, in the 15 minutes, uh, uh, sampling up to 40 organisms. And if we uh, look at the proportions that are positive at the bottom left-hand side, you can see that it's only by, the, they're around about 70 to 75% positive for each of the maneuvers, but if you add the maneuvers together, uh, so we pull the, uh, the counts at the end, that's where we get up to the 93%. So our process uh, is always uh, to date had the three different um, uh, maneuvers, and that's probably a sort of Poisson distribution of small numbers um, that um, uh, in order to increase the sensitivity, you want to increase the sampled volume of air. Uh, this is just looking at the concentration of those particles, and it's quite interesting. You look at the top left, the concentration 
per particle is actually the highest in the tidal breathing, just normal breathing. And in the model, uh, mathematical model to the side, you can see that um, uh, the vital capacity and the cough are about 70 or 90% less. Um, we've also looked to see if, the, um, if there's a relationship between uh, the concentration and the number of uh, particles produced and essentially does not, uh, doesn't reach statistical significance. And then this is um, uh, quite an interesting thing which is probably relevant to uh, other um, uh, pathogens. You can look that um, if, if we uh, look at the number of organisms produced by each of these uh, maneuvers and then try and work out how many of those maneuvers are likely to take place in a 24 hour period. Uh, in the graph B, you can see that we've got coughs going from around about 200 to 560. Those were the, the numbers of coughs that were recorded by uh, Carolyn Williams uh, during the 24-hour uh, sampling in her studies. And you can see that, in fact, tidal breathing is going to produce many, many more organisms um, than uh, the occasional cough. So if we put that together, uh, I hope I've shown you that the lung, in fact, is uh, a small particle aerosol generator. Um, we've used TB to illustrate this because it's uniquely characterized in obligate airborne transmission. Um, but transmission has been recognized for a long time to be predominantly spread by small particles, which are less than five microns. Those small particles are generated by all respiratory activities, or at least by these three uh, respiratory activities, including tidal breathing. And um, it seems to fit with the uh, postulation that the particles that arrived in the distal lung regions, and regardless of the maneuver, that's the source of the, um, of the organisms from this fluid film burst mechanism in the uh, terminal bronchioles. And that surprisingly, the high velocity in the large airways are not producing these particles. So uh, peripherally derived aerosols contribute a small volume. We're talking about nanoliters of, um, of uh, peripheral lung fluid um, to every exhaled breath. So we think that um, essentially we've um, bioaerosol research has now moved into a sort of non-invasive um, uh, bronchoalveolar lavage type of uh, uh, test. It's non-invasive. You have to deal with very small volumes and uh, relatively low numbers of organisms. Uh, this is uh, the team that uh, uh, has worked on presenting this uh, data. And uh, uh, here's the team again with um, uh, our funders. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and happy to answer any questions. Yeah. So we stop. Thank you, Robin. That was fantastic. Um, very interesting. And I just would like to encourage people to um, to use the Q and A. Robin, uh, while people are gathering their thoughts, um, can I just um, ask? Uh, this is not my field. I will preface this by, but I, I found it very fascinating to that tidal uh, breathing should. Um, be so important and it, it you've you've explained why at the end of your talk there but it, it's sort of at least initially counterintuitive in the experiment you mentioned if i've got it right people were required to breathe their vital capacity their forced vital capacity for a while and then tidal and then by coughing it is have i got that right and is there any potential then that some of these results might be related to the deep breathing that they were required to do before the tidal breathing? So I, I think um, you're touching on what I think is the mechanism. So when you cough, you have to take a deep breath in mm. before you cough. It's not the velocity. So what we're showing is it's not the velocity at which things come out, uh, particularly in the peripheral lung, the, the flow rates are essentially zero, so it's, it's diffusion. Um, so the cough is just accelerating those out. Obviously there are, there are um, consequences for that in the moist, um, warm uh, cloud that comes out is obviously gonna go further. So it doesn't, uh, you know, uh, coughing is still 
uh, going to distribute those a little bit more vigorously, but the number of uh, particles produced is far outweighed by uh, tidal breathing compared to the others. Uh, in fact, that's one of the limitations of this type of research is you can't get people to cough that many times. It becomes that people become ill if they cough more than 15 times. Right. So I think uh, I'm quite keen on moving the focus away from cough because um, under those circumstances, you're really only able to sample about 10 liters of expired air before people start getting very tired and finding it difficult. Um, whereas tidal breathing is easy to sample. And you can see that five minutes of tidal breathing gave us as many um, particles and as many organisms as the, uh, as the cough. Um, so essentially what I think we're going to move towards is tidal breathing with the occasional deep breath um, and to see if, if that will, um, uh, and that's what we're really working on our new, new protocols. It's much easier for patients. Um, coughing is, uh, is quite tricky. Um, I don't know if you, were in, if you were sort of mentioning the order at which um, the tests, uh, whether they might have impact, and we are working on... Uh, on uh, uh, reversing those. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the problem is this porcy bacillary um, bacteriology in that uh, distinguishing differences between very small numbers of, uh, of um, organisms is, is tricky. Um, so do, do, does this, I mean, this finding, does it have any influence, uh, impact, you think, on current advice we give to people with TB? Uh, particularly the finding also around sputum negative TB. Yes, so I think uh, in our part of the world and uh, where we have incredibly high TB rates, so we've got TB rates that are higher than 100 years ago in uh, Cape Town, uh, five-year-olds, 20% of them are already, already infected, 14-year-olds, 50% of them are infected, about 70, 80% of kids leaving school are already infected. And um, uh, the focus of my research was, uh, and in fact, this was a chat that I had with, um, with Steve Lorne uh, several years ago, is we're not going to control this disease until we stop people getting it. Um, so that was really why I focused on um, the aerosol uh, side of things. Um, if you look at epidemiological um, trails of infection, we can only explain about 30% of the transmission um, by those uh, from spear positive individuals in our communities. Uh, I think it's very different from um, low transmission um, environments such as Australia, but it's particularly important for us. For instance, um, uh, we think it's the amount of air that you share with, uh, with other individuals uh, can explain the poverty component of TB. So that um, I would estimate that uh, probably you and I exchange uh, 20 to 40 liters of air with other people. Um, if we were in one of our prisons in Polesmoor, uh, you would be changing, exchanging 2000 liters a day. So under those circumstances, the potential low infectivity, but uh, could be responsible for a very large um, uh, proportion of transmission, um, attributable risk of transmission in the communities. And I think um, our data would suggest at least 60% of that is the case. We don't know who's infecting the, um, the kids that I just told you about. If I give GPS monitors to children and to smear positive individuals in the clinics, they never meet each other. So some, there's some other mechanism of infection that's taking place and quite important in our poor communities. And that's really, I think this is compatible with that. So that's what we're working towards. Right, great, Robin. So we've got some questions now and not surprisingly, a couple of, a couple of them have brought up the issue of SARS-CoV-2. Aerosol science uh, has certainly become a lot more in focus over the last two years. So first question I'll, I'll mention is from you and Toby. Um, you've mentioned that being smutum positive versus negative has an influence on particle or organism numbers, but Ewan's asking, apart from that, is there much variation in particle or organism numbers between individuals? Uh, and he makes the point that this seems to be the case for SARS-CoV-2 exhalation. And, and if there is variation, any, any insights as to why? Well, I think that's um, a, a very apposite uh, question. 
Uh, yes, there is a tremendous, I mean, if you looked on those, um, on, on the graphs that I presented, the individual variability is quite high. Um, I think there are messages for um, COVID. I think um, uh, the sort of denial of small particle uh, transmission and transmission from asymptomatics was probably a little bit um, uh, incorrect. Uh, on the other hand, um, this, this uh, example is from tuberculosis, which is a lower respiratory tract infection. And I'm not sure that uh, when I showed those pictures of the, uh, of the photographs of sneezes, then there's no doubt there are some very large particles. And when we're talking about large there, we're talking about sort of 50 microns or bigger, um, which are not generated from the lower uh, respiratory tract, but um, are coming from the higher respiratory tract. So um, uh, yeah, this is relevant to lower respiratory tract infections, measles, TB, COVID in some individuals. Um, but these particles um, are, and the recognition that they're being generated by every respiratory activity that we've got um, really focuses uh, importance of ventilation, um, uh, particularly, and obviously crowding, and essentially the amount of air that you're sharing with other people. So it's, it's going to be impossible to stop transmission in Polesmore Prison where people are locked up in crowded individual in, in, uh, institution for long periods of time. And under those circumstances, it's, it's very difficult. And I think that's what's happening in the townships. Where if I measure the amount of air that these kids are, um, are exchanging, it's uh, 200 to four, 200 uh, liters a day. So much higher, 10 times higher than you or I. Thank you. Robin, your next question is actually uh, from someone who says they're an ex-colleague of yours, Dr. Kai Tram of the University of Washington Infectious Diseases, formerly at Stanford. He says he worked yeah. with you on your first TARDIS, yeah. and I assume the TARDIS That's Kai. refers to one of those amazing photos you showed us. Yeah, so it's it's the personalised clean room was called TARDIS, but it was sort of an in joke for English-speaking people that was completely lost on uh, right. on many many uh, nationalities. But right. I but I used to have the uh, the blue um, box with the um, the the flashing light on the top, but <laughs> I decided to give it up. <laughs> so, so, so welcome so to Dr. Kai. So Kai is asking um, if whether you might envisage this you, this technique that you've that you've shown us as a feasible case finding strategy to screen for subclinical TB or asymptomatic infectious people. Yes, um, this is a research tool rather than um, uh, than an operational tool. So. Uh, um, I did on the one slide I said that we were doing some uh, work at looking at asymptomatic carriage. I it was only after I found such high um, numbers and proportions of people infected that I even considered going into the general population. I, I thought uh, it was going to be incredibly low, but uh, we're finding, um, so this is very early data, but uh, we've run 25 um, uh, patients or subjects that are completely well, and we found uh, probably about 70% of them we can find organisms. Uh, these are particularly um, heavily burdened uh, societies. So um, we are doing that. Uh, we, we think this is more of a sort of gold standard for which we can compare other uh, tests. So uh, we're, we're trying to compare the mask technologies of uh, Carolyn Williams with uh, these organisms that we're finding. The difference is these are live organisms, so that we're trying to understand uh, how the organism uh, adapts and uh, to its sort of extra host survival in order to get to the next host. Um, but um, uh, we were surprised that we found such high proportions that we are finding it in um, in uh, relatively healthy individuals. Great, thanks, Rob. And I think I think that answers the question. Um, Kai was particularly wondering whether you could accommodate high volumes of individuals, you know, in situations like a mobile van visiting a township. But it sounds like the answer to that is no, from what you've just said. Yeah. So I think that um, I don't think this is a diagnostic tool for TB disease. I actually putting forward a hypothesis that maybe this is a redefinition of latent disease. Mm. That instead of latent disease uh, being assumed to be totally non-infectious, that this is a population in a specific 
uh, part of the, um, the, the human compartment uh, that is optimized for maintaining transmission in these type of uh, communities. Um, that becomes a somewhat controversial. Um, so it, when we're going through looking for the healthy volunteers, we're trying to link it to um, a quantifier and immunological memory of uh, disease. Um, but um, it's an interesting field, but I, I hope I've, uh, I've got people to be a little bit more interested in something that really hasn't changed for 100 years is changing rapidly. And, uh, you know, people are using non-volatile, volatile organic compounds, etc. cetera. Um, it's, the problem is you're dealing with very small numbers of droplets and organisms, and it needs to change the technology with which to be able to do that. Right, thank you. Um, we have another question here from uh, Professor Miles Davenport. Miles heads the Infection Analytics Program here at the Kirby Institute. He's wondering how quantitative the process is. Um, and, and this comes from a, um, the issue he's raised is there's an ongoing question, for example, in SARS-CoV-2 uh, about viral loads in the, in the lung versus what we tend to sample in the nose and the throat. So can you measure lung loads from total expired virus we're now talking about rather than TB? Um, what we can, so it's an interesting question and raises lots of complexities to that. What I can say is that if we follow individuals during treatment and we follow smear positive and smear negative individuals, the vast majority of them have a rapid decline in numbers. So um, it's quantitative in that way, um, but I'm not sure that it's giving us a um, quantitative sort of body uh, burden of disease. Um, I think that uh, reading between the lines of the question, I think that um, that wouldn't be something that we can claim we could do, uh, largely because of the variability of uh, particle production by different individuals. Um, vital capacities are incredibly different between young people, old people, males, females, etc. But um, I was quite surprised that we actually develops such a sensitive uh, methodology and that's really set us off on uh, a series of other experiments to um, uh, to try and see how you can use this so I've always had this sort of philosophy that we see diseases through the assays we have uh, so a new assay gives us an opportunity to look at new aspects of the disease um, but I don't think that I would claim that we although it's it's semi-quantitative um, I'm more interested in the qualitative change. I haven't shown you here. We, we can take uh, electron microscopy, um, um, uh, transmission electron micrographs of these organisms and, for instance, look at the cell wall. Um, it seems as though some of the organisms are uh, different from the organisms you get in sputum. They stain with uh, oramine. Uh, we can identify um, um, uh, RD9 DNA. But interestingly, they don't stain with ZN stain. So um, uh, there are a lot of um, phenotypic changes, which uh, qualitative changes, which we're sort of working on. Uh, but I would think this is at best a semi-quantitative tool. Thank you very much, Robin. I think our time for your talk is pretty much up. So thank you for such a, an excellent overview of the, the history and the current moment, which is clearly an exciting one as we as we start, start to play a bit more attention to what's happening in aerosols. So thank you, Robin, and I'll now move thank on you, to, I'll now move on to uh, introducing our second speaker, uh, Professor Linda Gale Becker, who many of us know very well. Linda Gale is Chief Executive Officer of the Desmond Tutu Health Foundation and Director of the Desmond Tutu HIV Centre at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Linda Gale is an A-rated clinical scientist, Professor of Medicine and Director of the Desmond Tutu HIV Centre at the University of Cape Town. Her interests include HIV, TB and STI treatment and prevention. She's also CEO of the Desmond Tutu Health Foundation, which seeks to reduce the impact of HIV and related conditions amongst the most vulnerable through HIV research and innovation. And, and I see a real similarity, Linda Gow, there with the, the work of the Kirby, with our work with marginalized populations. Linda's talk today is entitled COVID-19 and Vaccination, the South African Journals so far. Over to you, Linda Gow. Thanks so much, um, 
to you, uh, Andrew, for that introduction, and of course to Tony and the Kirby for having us. Uh, we appreciate you guys having us. Oh, I've just brought Robin's talk back. I'm wondering why. Let me just stop that. Stop sharing that and share this one. There we go. All right. Well, um, thank you so much and a real pleasure to raise this talk, COVID-19 and vaccination, and just telling you a little bit about where, from where we have come um, in South Africa and Africa at large. And of course, just to remind everyone that it is just a few short months ago that a new virus and a new pandemic was declared. And certainly COVID-19 has changed our world. We were just talking about how uh, we had to refine our travel toothbrushes um, to actually make this trip. So very exciting to be here in Australia. Glad that you guys opened up and we could visit. Um, of course, COVID has also had a huge impact on the continent of Africa. So today I'm going to talk about that burden in some detail, talk about vaccines as an exit strategy for the epidemic, talk about the challenge of new variants, our response to rescue healthcare workers in South Africa, known as the Sasanki study, and then touch a little bit on the intersection between HIV and COVID-19 as we've seen it, and end with a few thoughts around vaccine availability and access. So of course, the virus from Wuhan in China was declared a pandemic in March of 2020. And subsequently, this uh, work from Murray and uh, the, the team in The Lancet just uh, recently published, showing the cumulative incidence um, in the population, the, all of these uh, countries have had, had the numbers who've been infected at least once. So uh, you can see again uh, the African continent uh, particularly impacted in that way. And here again shown from Barber in the Lancet, the daily and cumulative infections, uh, the sub-Saharan Africa in the dark purple. So we have borne an enormous burden We've also seen four waves on the continent, each of them due to a new variant. So around uh, 11 and a half million case, accumulative cases, although this is thought to be an underestimate due to low testing levels, particularly in the mid region uh, of the continent. Um, and definitely deaths are underrepresented. So here again, uh, recently published showing all age rate per 100,000 person years of uh, cases, uh, of deaths, sorry. Uh, but then very importantly, to look at this ratio uh, to excess mortality of excess mortality to reported deaths. And, and again, you see that flip in terms of uh, Africa having uh, the very uh, high ratio of excess mortality to, in fact, reported cases. Um, better down in South Africa and Botswana, where uh, more testing and more, um, uh, I think, clearer reporting. But even in South Africa, we've, we've probably underestimated our real death rate by uh, threefold. So there has been a cost in lives directly, and here you see the excess deaths by region, and of course indirectly, so between 5 and 29 million people pushed into extreme poverty due to COVID. Um, and again, children really bearing the brunt of that, an additional 140 million children in developing countries have been projected into households living below the poverty line. We've also seen impacts on other diseases, and mine uh, that I have a great deal of interest in HIV. Here you see um, countries that have seen a real drop in HIV testing during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, in South Africa, we estimated about a 50% reduction in HIV testing, 50% reduction in art initiations, although luckily, thankfully, due to differentiated service delivery, we saw less of a drop in art collection. So we are expecting to see for many months the impact of COVID, as I say, indirectly on other epidemics. I thought I would just share this study we did during COVID, known as Buddy, uh, where we offered adolescents living with HIV the opportunity to have their art couriered 
to them at home using a wonderful um, homegrown courier system called IESA. Um, and almost all the adolescents chose to have their, their drugs uh, delivered to them at home. Uh, there was very good acceptability. And the hope, of course, is that these differentiated service delivery models will live on beyond COVID um, and impact our clients even in other ways as we go forward. So let's turn now to South Africa. Here you see cumulative cases in South Africa vis-a-vis -vis the rest of Africa. And South Africa accounts for a large proportion of infections uh, in Africa, although certainly far less so globally. We're a country of about 55 million, um, but the country also took very early steps to try and flatten the curve. And I put that in inverted commas, uh, because as you can see, we have three, four very distinct curves that seemingly we did not win uh, the flattening of the curve to the extent that we had hoped. But we've had very extensive uh, restrictive lockdowns, starting from uh, the first cases in March of 2020, um, level five was incredibly restrictive, and you see a description of how the levels have come and gone, depending on our various um, uh, variants. And it is indeed the variants that have driven uh, our four waves. So firstly, ancestral, then the beta variant, the delta variant, and then the Omicron variant. And we've only just recently come out of our state of disaster. So it's been really two years of extensive uh, restrictive uh, regulations. Here are the hospital admissions over those four waves. Um, and you can see how each has been quite distinct, Delta being definitely the most extensive in that regard. Um, and then now the related deaths. And strikingly, and I'll show that, um, well, let me just quickly mention, first of all, uh, these are the actual deaths due to, to COVID. And then South Africa has a very good system of measuring um, excess deaths. And you can see, although we had uh, just over 100,000 COVID-related deaths uh, reported so far, more than 300,000 have been lost nationally from natural causes. And these excess deaths seem to follow the same uh, four waves. Far fewer of these were under 60 years. Um, and this graph showing the cases and deaths together shows that fourth wave uncoupling, which of course was very distinct about Omicron, was the, the, the differentiation of a large number of cases and far fewer deaths. And we'll go into that in a, a bit more detail. So we have experienced the ancestral, the beta, the delta, and the Omicron variants of concern. Um, and the, this is beautifully shown. We do have a good ge genetic surveillance system in country uh, built on our HIV genetic surveillance. Um, and here you see, again, those four waves and now the Omicron wave splitting into at least five sub lineages within uh, known as BA1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And we, we're experiencing all of those with 4 and 5 uh, really starting to be far more uh, apparent, as you see here um, from uh, Tulio. And I must acknowledge him, Tulio de la Vera and his team at CRISP, who are doing uh, fantastic work in this regard. So let's turn quickly to the vaccines. Um, and here you see a selection of them in South Africa. We've had two, Pfizer, um, two dose, and then the Janssen single dose. Uh, and we used the Janssen because of this uh, opportunity that it does not require um, deep freezing. Um, and speed and coverage is obviously on, on its side. But it's been an extraordinary uh, development. And I really like Eric Topol's recent tweet showing just really within 12 short months how both Moderna and Pfizer, um, you know, really covered the world in, in many ways with vaccination. 
But vaccines, as we know, have two kinds of uh, impacts. The first and perhaps the most important and for which I think COVID-19 vaccines were developed is to protect all people at risk of infection, including the most vulnerable from severe disease and death. Um, and then, of course, the sort of secondary was to really try and up immunity across the board um, and, and protect individuals more broadly thereafter. So I think reassuringly, the COVID-19 vaccines have been able to sustainably protect against more severe disease and death. And here, um, this really showing some impressive results, even with uh, some of the re more recent variants. So we've maintained uh, VE against death, even with variants. We saw some impact in terms of symptomatic disease with the beta variant. And here you see uh, the single dose Johnson & Johnson seeing some reduction, uh, but reasonable protection against more severe disease. Um, what do we know about symptomatic COVID-19 caused by the beta variant? Well, as I say, we definitely saw a ding in the vaccines with the beta variant. And I think this is when we had the first indication that variants were going to matter. Um, and that we needed to be perhaps uh, careful about, um, you know, which vaccines were used when. So this is vaccin vaccinology, according to me. Uh, we seem to be doing okay with reducing deaths and hospitalization. But when it comes to infection protection, we've seen an undermining of that. And that may be one, due to viral escape, or two, due to waning uh, immunity. And that has resulted in the so-called breakthrough infection, which has to a certain amount undermined uh, vaccines. And I'll end with some thoughts around vaccine hesitancy. Um, but in February of 2021, with the third wave on our doorstep, we were very concerned about our, you know, almost a million healthcare workers, 500,000 of them are frontline. Um, we did not have any vaccines on hand. We had AstraZeneca, but it was clear from a small study run by Shabir Mahdi that AstraZeneca took a big ding with the beta variant. Um, and so with that in mind, we moved 750 doses, 50,000 doses of AZ to the side and brought in Johnson & Johnson, which we did have some evidence for. So this was an ur urgent intervention. It was an opportunity to offer early access. Um, and we were able to do this before the national rollout actually started. So we did this as a study, a phase 3B study, because it was not yet licensed in country. Uh, the vaccines were donated by Johnson & Johnson. And we thought we would use the opportunity also to evaluate the vaccine in terms of mild, moderate, severe disease and death. Um, and we did this at 122 sites, 500,000 healthcare workers signed informed consent, uh, and we vaccinated them over this period, as you see the gray bars, just before the third wave. We did see some breakthrough infections, but the vast majority, almost 96%, were considered either asymptomatic or mild, um, and we saw a very low rate of deaths. Um, the single dose was also found to be safe. This was now this is in press at CID. We have an earlier publication in the NEJM showing that really uh, the only um, adverse event that reaches um, a level above the observed versus expected ratio is for Guillain-Barre syndrome. And of course, for this unusual thrombotic thrombocytopenic syndrome, uh, each of which go above the, the 1.0 uh, in terms of the ratio. This is a paper we've just had published of the primary vaccine effectiveness. Um, in these almost 500,000 healthcare workers. Uh, we see that VE is maintained in the elderly. It's maintained in people living with HIV. We had 40,000 healthcare workers in the cohort. Um, and it was similar for both beta and delta. And here you see hospital admissions VE about 67%. Uh, 
ICU 75% and the protection against death of the single dose J&J was 83%. And here you see uh, it did not matter whether it was the beta variant or the delta variant, we saw similar protection. So an extraordinary opportunity, 500,000 individuals followed um, and, you know, quite a, um, an epic event in my own career to be part of this uh, over time. So just to play this out a little bit more, it does look like we have these breakthrough infections raising the question of boosting. And of course, we are now all in the boosting era. And it seems that what boost does is it uh, improves antibody levels um, and therefore offers some more protection against infection. Um, and there was this, I think, some hinting that perhaps then breakthrough infection occurs, but with lower viral loads, maybe having an impact on onward uh, transmission. So definitely, I think we are in the boosting era. So Sonki, uh, has also moved into boosting. So we were able to offer a second dose of J&J to the 500,000 Sasanki uh, participants. This again was done through the vaccine centers. About half took up the offer. So only half stepping forward, but we were able to then look at two doses of Pfizer versus two doses of J&J. Um, the two doses in Sasanki against uh, general population in South Africa. And here you see that really the two uh, doses are very similar across the board. And this is in the Omicron era. So good news, uh, we're seeing very similar protection uh, with two doses, regardless of what type of vaccination against Omicron. Sasanki is the gift which keeps on giving. Um, so we are in Sasanki 3 now, looking at Pfizer as a third dose. Uh, we have a study about to start of Moderna after one or two doses of J&J. And we will be comparing this next to a primary vaccination uh, of Pfizer in Anglo minors. There are a number of immunogenicity studies ongoing at the moment as well, and we hope we'll be able to offer particularly some great information about HIV, uh, people living with HIV in this study. We've learned a lot of lessons. Uh, we've published this in the SMJ. I won't go through it. But if any of you are thinking about conducting very large phase threes, and I think of you, Andrew, with your beautiful EPIC study, um, there are some amazing lessons to be learned. But maybe the one that's the take home is around the three Cs that I think we can apply to PrEP as well, is that people will take up something like this if they are confident about its effectiveness and its safety, if it's convenient for them, and they realize that they need it. So we have to overcome complacency. I think of it as the three C's um, and something I think we can apply. But moving on now to the Western Cape, where I come from in Cape Town, uh, there's a group there uh, run by the Western Cape government that's doing some beautiful work. So again, that pattern of the four waves uh, applies to uh, the Western Cape. You can see our burden of disease. We have a huge number of intentional injuries that actually cause most of the deaths um, amongst young men. Um, and then HIV and TB, very prevalent. Uh, but here you see COVID-19 in 2021 beginning to uh, overshadow that. Um, looking at uh, surveillance studies in the Western Cape, there were at least four of these uh, seroprevalent studies linked to both um, non-communicable diseases, diabetes in this case, and to people living with HIV. You can see that seroprevalence has, uh, has accumulated over the three waves from 28% to 47% to 66%. So we have an incredibly high seroprevalence rate in our communities. And you see a snapshot of the kind of communities that Robin was talking about, these high burden for TB have also been high burden for SARS-CoV-2. Um, and here, this is uh, in particular looking at these township uh, communities, household income much less than 3,000 rand per um, month, um, and the, the highest era prevalence occurring in poorer communities. So again, what Robin was saying about shared air and how much volume of air you share matters when it comes to SARS-CoV-2 as well. Um, 
relative immune protection in poorer communities comes, however, at a massive mortality cost. And uh, we'll come back to some of that in a moment. But we again conducted a study funded by the EDCTP to see if we could impact transmission in the household using a number of NPIs. So coming in with information, sanitation, masks, et cetera, into these crowded environments to try to uh, intervene. And in fact, the study failed miserably in that regard. Most of the household contacts were already infected by the time contact was made. So test, trace, um, and, and you know, trying to impact in these crowded communities is really a waste of time. Um, and so uh, what we did find, however, is going into those communities, we're able to find households that were incredibly in dire straits, did not have food. We could bring in food um, and intervene in that way, which was far more impactful than trying to stop SARS-CoV-2, which was frankly <coughs> unstoppable. And here you see, uh, what I've just described in a number of households in one crowded, this is how it looks in Kailicha, where there are about a million and a half people living in that kind of uh, crowded environment. You can see wave one versus wave two versus wave three and then wave four in terms of uh, evidence of reinfection. So by the time we got to wave uh, three, you were really seeing far less reinfection because individuals were already um, having very high seroprevalence. So all the disease occurring upfront during those restrictive lockdowns when people were transmitting uh, the ancestral and the beta strain to each other, um, perhaps protecting them later on, except for Omicron which has come in in its own shape and form. And we know that there is viral escape uh, from this virus, which is doing it, I guess, in order to, to escape, in order to reinfect. So the Omicron period was associated with lower hazards of severe outcome, which is good news. We think probably um, due to, on the one hand, potentially poor, uh, when we've uh, the the effect of severe outcome is attenuated when we adjust for prior diagnosed infection and vaccination, uh, but when we consider prior unascertained infections, then it looks like there's reduced risk of prior infections um, that they're even above what we were saying. So we think there is some reduced virulence of Omicron. In, in addition, and again, Marianne has, has uh, described this very well. It's not only the Western Cape, this is a study from Shabir in Gauteng, showing in 7,000 people, seropositivity rates of about 70% in the unvaccinated and 93% in the vaccinated population. So again, um, it, you know, extraordinary seroprevalence. So, the impact of hybrid immunity uh, being another concept. And we do think this is why South Africa has now come out of its state of emergency, even though our overall vaccination rates are only 39%. Um, we do have this uh, wonderful gift of hybrid immunity now, where many, many are protected. Um, due to the fact that we've had so much infection. So where are we heading? Well, about 11.5 billion doses given out around the world now, 146 shots per 100 people. Uh, again, however, my continent sits on the paler side, as you see. Um, and in South Africa, although we're in the darker green, we're only 35% of our population vaccinated uh, overall. So this is what I talk about the three speed vaccinations uh, with advanced economies way ahead of sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and again, many graphs and pictures to illustrate just how we're doing. South Africa sits uh, about in that top block somewhere in the middle, but you can see Mauritius, Seychelles, uh, Morocco, uh, other countries that uh, are leading the way on the continent. Overall, um, those who have completed vaccination sitting at about 17% in Africa. And again, uh, the, the island states having done better than any others uh, in, in Africa. 
So as I mentioned, we have Johnson and Johnson and Pfizer, um, and you can see how the pyramid works, um, most of the vaccination being taken up in the over 60s, um, and definitely a lot of work to be done in the 15 to 35 year olds, where we have really seen a great deal of vaccine hesitancy. There has been a lot said about vaccines and vaccine availability. And here you can see the countries that are mostly producing vaccines, USA, India, um, and of course, China coming uh, very much to the fore. The cost of vaccines, very important. I you know, just shockingly that Moderna and Pfizer have actually gone up in price uh, most recently, even though the, the vice president recently said that making an mRNA vaccine is a clean, fast process that requires a relatively small footprint to make many doses. Uh, the cheapest vaccine to date is in fact AstraZeneca Chadox. This uh, was, for those of you who don't know, the COVAX initiative was brought about almost like a PEPFAR or a global fund, um, including the Gavi Alliance and the World Health Organization to bring vaccines to the LMICs. It was to ge generate the development of vaccines, but also to ensure vaccine equity. And the goal was to make sure that countries could at least vaccinate up to 20% of their population. Unfortunately, the experiment has not worked as well as we would have hoped. Um, and that's because I think there are many more factors that need to be needed to be thought about. Um, and this is a paper that Ingrid Katz and I wrote a while ago uh, that tried to unpack some of these aspects. Um, but one other thought, and, and some of you may be following the news, uh, the, the concept of TRIPS, um, uh, the temporary suspension or waiver of intellectual property rights um, protected under the trade related intellectual property rights is something that South African India has been really pushing for to see whether, um, for example, patents can be shared ahead of time. And there have been many um, cynics saying, well, even if we got the patents, what would we do with them? And I'm very pleased to say that we now have a hub in South Africa um, and Afrogen Biologics is leading this, that although she has not, um, and Petro to Blanche is, is uh, really the powerhouse here, although she has not uh, received the, the license from Moderna, she's gone onto the internet, found ways and has been able to make an mRNA vaccine that looks just like Moderna. So it is possible um, and something that, you know, I think the country and the continent is pursuing to, to work towards self-reliance. South Africa is already filling and finishing Johnson & Johnson and will be supplying 450 million doses of j, &J uh, to the continent. We also are watching with enthusiasm and, and great um, hope Patrick Soon Cheong, one uh, ex South African, now a billionaire who lives in Los Angeles, a scientist, and he has decided to reinvest in South Africa. It's called Nantese. He's opened a huge plant in Cape Town and will hopefully be manufacturing vaccines not only for COVID, but also for HIV, TB, and cancer. And of course, global vaccine equity is critical for all of us. It uh, has an impact on health, on economy and on society. And so something I think we do need to keep worrying about. But in the meantime, we have ongoing ethical dilemmas. Uh, do we worry about coverage on the continent or should we be boosting? Uh, can we fractionate for boosting? How often do we need to boost if we can't yet actually cover everyone? What about children ahead of adults? Um, is vaccine hesitancy a big issue for us? Can we turn to mandates? And what about how will we design the secondary vaccines uh, of the future? Uh, we were chatting about Tony F just a little bit earlier, and of course, he very much um, encouraged us to make sure that even though vaccines may not be as effective in people who, uh, who live with HIV and other immune suppressed individuals, some degree of immunity is better than none. Um, and indeed, we've been able to show, first of all, on the epi side, that uh, people living with HIV, in, at least in the Western Cape, have a twofold increased uh, risk of um, 
uh, of uh, more severe outcomes with, with COVID. Um, and here you see risk factors for disease uh, twofold higher, and this has been borne out in other um, studies around the world. People who have more advanced HIV do less well with a 3.8 uh, adjusted hazard ratio in terms of COVID. And of course, again, recently in the news, people living with HIV uh, may be a place where variants uh, may develop. And this study of an individual with uncontrolled HIV, very low CD4, developed a large number of variants over a long period of time, um, and definitely something I think we have to be thinking about. We know that natural immunity is compromised in people who live with HIV, lower um, immunoglobulins and neutralizing antibodies, but also lower T cell responses. Although in this study showing very nice responses to CHADOX, um, as you see. In this study uh, from Mary, Mary Ann Davies, again, uh, looking at vaccine effect in the Western Cape, we see a hazard ratio that is reduced um, in, in terms of COVID-19 death in people who are vaccinated living with HIV. And when we compare people living with HIV and those without, it does look like vaccine effectiveness is very well maintained for infection, for admission, and for, uh, for death. There have been a number of analyses now um, of uh, vaccination, and it does seem that People with lower CD4 counts may have lower vaccine effectiveness, but tolerability looks the same. And certainly in terms of those other outcomes, there is a, a lot of hope. Sadly, not a lot of studies done in people living with HIV. We've recently had a look to see where we could find some data. Um, and there is a little more data than there was before. But prompted by this, we have started a study known as the Ubuntu study. Uh, we will be enrolling 14,000 people living with HIV in 50 sites, um, and we've reached about 6,000 so far, and we're offering Moderna, um, either three doses or two doses in people living with HIV. Early results from this study would show uh, with Omicron in, uh, in particular, there is quite a lot of asymptomatic carriage, and this seems to be associated with lower CD4 counts. So again, as CD4 counts drop, we see a higher rate of asymptomatic carriage amongst individuals. And I'll end with just a few thoughts around vaccine hesitancy. Although uh, in LMICs, it was thought not to be a big problem. And here's a study showing, uh, you know, lower than other parts of the world in terms of uh, vaccine hesitancy. This hasn't played out in South Africa. And, um, and we've had two surveys now looking at this factor. Um, and here, looking at the unvaccinated population, quite a high number of individuals, about 5,000 individuals, um, six in 10 still do not want to be vaccinated. Men are more hesitant than women. There's higher hesitancy amongst the educated and the better resourced. And although there's support for mandates, uh, although the support for mandates is low, um, people do believe that they might work, but do not support that as a concept. In terms of vaccination in South Africa, we have seen it as a very important intervention to protect the workforce, particularly healthcare workers, to protect the vulnerable, uh, particularly the elderly and those with comorbidities, to prevent individuals from getting severe disease and death, and to contribute to universal immunity um, and as you can, as I've told you, as this has happened, it's been mostly through a natural um, immunity. So to wrap up, Andrew, and thank you again for having us. The South African story is that we have, thankfully, in some ways, it's a two-edged sword, uh, established platforms mostly developed by HIV, which has allowed rapid surveillance and understanding of the epidemiology of COVID-19. We have the biggest burden of HIV in any country, and this has, I, I guess, given us a head start in this new pandemic. 
Our poorer communities have had higher infection rates in early waves with substantial mortality, perhaps exacerbated by lockdowns rather than not, uh, but protection against severe disease in subsequent waves has been our, um, our experience. HIV, especially uncontrolled and tuberculosis remain risks for COVID-19 death, but vaccines are strongly protective. The Omicron wave was associated with lower mortality due to a combination of protection conferred by prior infection, vaccination, and to an extent, reduced virulence. And vaccine hesitancy continues to undermine our campaign, but we do thankfully have high levels of hybrid immunity. And with that, I'll thank you all again for, um, for uh, allowing us to be here today. Cindy Gale, thank you for that masterful overview. Um, I'm exhausted thinking about work you've done in the last two years. You know, uh, I thought uh, the Epic New South Wales study of nearly 10,000 participants was a huge study, and you've told us about your uh, Sasonke with half a million participants. So uh, congratulations, you've um, changed the world in many ways uh, over the last two and a half years. Uh, quite extraordinary. Um, I do encourage people to get their answers, their questions in. If you don't ask them quick, you, you'll probably miss your chance. But I, I'm just going to start with, with one question about um, uh, hesitancy. Um, and I'm wondering about your elderly population. I see, I see about, I think your vaccination rate's about 70% uh, in that age, which is decent, but it's, you know, given the excess mortality uh, in that age, it's still deeply troubling, isn't it? Yes, indeed. And Andrew, you've hit the nail on the head. I mean, when I see, I have Australia envy again, when I see the rates you guys have been able to, I think we have to really interrogate, you know, why, even as we were driving through the streets of Sydney, it was going through my mind, how is it that individuals have, you know, sort of taken it up so much better here? Mm -hmm. um, we've looked the, the disease in the face, you know, literally, um, and yet people are still hesitant. I think, you know, I think the social media has played quite an, an impactful role here. Um, we definitely have more than I expected a large number of anti-vaxxers. Um, and this has played a role that has also somehow converged on um, sort of anti-science and also got mixed up with sort of re religious, um, uh, you know, intersections so uh the elderly often you know those who are under resourced may not have um all of the opportunity to understand that th these vaccines what they do you know what their safety is etc on the one hand i think having an impact on confidence um and then the the better resourced i think our big problem there is complacency so you know we we've sort of got those two ends of, of the, the seas. Um, and somehow we have to really uh, find ways to work at, at, at that. I encourage people, if they are interested, to go and look at those surveys. They're now published online. Um, and they, they, they really go into a great deal of depth around why people may not be stepping forward and, and, you know, what we might need to do. The country's tried a few things. You could get a hundred rand if you go and get a shot and you're over 60. Um, there is, uh, you know, lottos that have been tried. Uh, there are various ways of trying to get those numbers up. Um, obviously, the country can't give too much. I'm also doing that study in the Anglo mines. The Anglo mines, if you do boost you get two cows, um, which I thought was pretty, uh, I guess for a miner that might be, I wasn't quite sure what I would do with two cows, but for a miner might be huge. So, you know, I think we have to think of all kinds of ways to, to dig people out and, and move them along. But of course, now our biggest threat is just that I think people have become very complacent because of the high rates of, of natural immunity. And, and I think we have to just see how, how that plays out. It's a global issue, isn't it? I think, um, Linda Garland, you know, we, we've just recently in our region, if you like, um, seen a bit of a tragedy happen in Hong Kong, which kept COVID out almost completely for a couple of years. But because it never attained um, 
uh, very high rates of vaccination in the elderly there had the most extraordinary wave of mortality yeah. over a short period of time. A real, a real tragedy in a, in a setting which had done so well with the yeah. non-pharmaceutical interventions. But, yeah. Mm. A couple of questions, and I think you've answered a lot of them, but um, Tafi Marukutira, and apologies for murdering your name, Tafi, um, just wondered about the particular role in, in vaccine hesitancy of home remedies, traditional medicine, uh, religious beliefs in the African setting. Do, do they explain much of it, do you think? I think to a certain extent there is quite a lot, and it's more around the the fear of vaccination than believing that those remedies will will necessarily treat them against COVID. I think some of it, you know, I think it's been in equal amount, but but surprisingly, there's been a lot of fear about what a vaccine is. Um, and, you know, are you in some ways transgressing some kind of either traditional or religious belief by allowing this vaccine into the body, which is quite upsetting for us because you know we've done vaccine studies in the country particularly around HIV and TB for many many years and we've always been struck at how willing people are to participate and then we have brilliant uptake of our pediatric vaccination so our EPI there's huge belief in 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 childhood immunization um so again whether this is social media you know, lots of people quoted this, this was too fast, you know, don't like the fact that it's an RNA involved in there somewhere, although again, you know, lots of discussion around the fact that it isn't. Um, just, I think, a lot to unpack and not enough time to really get down to people and, and make sure that we've educated them sufficiently. Mm. Absolutely. One point that I wanted to make in relation to something you said about um, vaccination of those at particular risk, include, particularly people with HIV, was, in, in your words, some immunity is better than none. And, and I think that's really important in our messaging because we're finding, even in Australia, with access to boosters among people with immune disorders, for example, that they hear the message that the vaccine doesn't work very well in them and so from they take on take from that oh i won't get vaccinated when of course we want them to take the message it may not be quite as perfect but it will absolutely reduce your risk of severe disease and and i think that's a that's a message matter of messaging that we could all do better on Please. on another matter gail matthews who uh, gail leads the therapeutic and back leads the therapeutic and vaccine research program here at the kirby um, and does quite a bit of stuff on long COVID at the moment. Now, a country with, with that degree of experience, with those waves of COVID, different subtypes, millions of cases, any insights for, on long COVID in, from the South African experience? So, Andrew, I don't know, and Gail, I, I don't know if this is because we've just been so overwhelmed mm. by, you know, the primary disease that somehow long COVID has, you know, ha hasn't had the the bandwidth that I think it has received in other parts of the world. I know that there are some clinics beginning to spring up and, and people are starting to, you know, look at the literature and find ways to begin therapy. Um, certainly anecdotally, I'm aware of individuals who've, who, you know, who are really suffering and these include children all the way up to the elderly. Um, and people are beginning to try different types of therapies to see what, what could happen. But to be honest, that has been quite nascent. Um, and so aside from the sort of anecdotal, uh, there isn't too much happening in the country yet. And I haven't seen any new data around, you know, new insights or interventions. So I think it's a, it's, it's a gap. Right. Unfortunately, um... Linda Gale and everybody, that's our time for today uh, and we'll need to wrap up. Um, so I really would like to just conclude by thanking both Linda Gale and Robin, two international leaders in their fields for visiting today. And it's terrific that you're actually visiting us in the flesh, even though we haven't been able to do this seminar today uh, in the flesh, but at least that does give a lot more people the possibility to, to hear your words. So, um, Thank you very much again, and thanks everybody for tuning in today. Bye for now.